Let's go to the Lord. Take a moment. Examine your life. Examine what's going on in your soul. What's being chal- what challenges you're facing? How are you dealing with it? Are you winning? Are you losing? Are you worried? Are you fearful? Angry? Jealous? You hurt? The Lord has provided a way for us to have victory over all the details of life, all the adversities and challenges of life. He's, he's given us the means. And we've been taught those means in this church. And it's my desire that that, that, less, that, that message go on a hundred years from now through this outfit. Let's pray for that. Confess any sin that you might have and ask the Lord to open your heart today to see where you might have victory. Father, we are grateful for grace, for the Holy Spirit, for the methods of applying faith to the revealed word through the ministry of the Spirit. It all works on the power of the Spirit. There is no Christian life apart from the Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, it's only human effort. And that doesn't go past the ceiling. And so we pray today, Father, that you'd open our eyes. Let us see what's going on around us. Let us see the angelic war, how we fit into it, and how our church fits into it. And I pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. I've done a study, and this is quite a common study that's done in denominations and different, different Christian groups, and it's about the life cycle of a church. I think it's important information for us to understand where we are, and this is something that you're, I'm not going to pass judgment on where we are as a church. I'm going to let you do that yourself. But like all things in life, Churches have a beginning, they grow and or diminish, and they often die. They close their doors. Ideally, churches grow in healthy ways, last for multiple generations, and multiply by giving birth to other like-minded churches. The first century, the model was small house churches in any city, so they didn't have big buildings to meet in. They just had homes. And they met in these homes. And so they were all interconnected. So when he writes to the church at Corinth, he's not writing to one. He's writing to a congregation of believers that meet in different places at different times, but they're all interconnected. So this house church model, they never thought about mega churches. That was in the third century with Constantine when, they, when the Catholic Church began, and then they began to build cathedrals and such as that. But the megachurch was, I don't believe, of the Lord. But churches are often born through evangelism. They grow by maturing believers who are prepared and willing to minister effectively to souls in their own particular world where they work in their neighborhoods, or wherever they are. They minister to those around, bringing them into the church and birthing new churches. When believers in the church become complacent, stop reaching out through evangelism and ministry, the church loses momentum and begins a downward spiral that will eventually result in the church dying. It's happened millions of times. Millions of times over the centuries. I mean, this is a 2,000-year two, uh, operation, Christianity, and millions upon millions of churches have been born, had a life cycle, and died out. It just happens. This is the reality of life. There's no escaping it. Unless, unless, but the lifeblood of the church is hungry people for truth and families with children who want to raise their children in a truth-teaching church. That's the lifeblood. 
you got to have input. You got to have people coming in. You got to have outreach and you got to have people coming in. It's just a fact. Now, what constitutes a local church? This is a really important discussion because in the world at large, there's a lot of things called a church that are not a church at all. They are not a church. A church must consist of born-again believers, saved people indwelt by the Holy Spirit. See, the church is not a building or even an organization. It's, it's the people that are saved. That's the church. If you're saved, you're the church. It, it has to become more than a Bible study. A local church becomes an organization. It turns into an organization. It has goals, policies. So you can, you can have a Bible study, and you don't need any of that. You just show up, you study the Bible, you drink a little coffee, you know, socialize a little bit, and you go home. Church is more than that. A church takes responsibility for evangelism, for teaching the Word, for training ministers, for preparing the believer to minister to the world. Church is more than just a Bible study. But often a Bible study, God will use a Bible study to turn it into a church. All of a sudden, I was in the Huntsville group. It was just a little Bible study meeting in Joe Hall's house. Been meeting there for years. Buddy Pete was teaching it. Within about two or three weeks, we added... 10 to 12 to 15 people just went whoosh. And Buddy went, what is going on? Turned into a church. Still is. Okay? The Lord did that. But we didn't do that. We didn't do a lot of outreach. I mean, he didn't do any outreach. It just, the Lord brought people in. They came and they went, like here. And an organization developed. We had to have a meeting time, we had to have policies about how giving was to be done. All types of things had to develop. So, an administrative board is required. The handling of duties of running the church. These things have to be done. This is a, this is a local church of believers. As believers grow spiritually, the church organizes itself around gifts. The groups take responsibility for evangelism and teaching the Word of God. People come along, they mature. Gary Horton says, I'm supposed to go out and evangelize. I say, I'm supposed to go out and teach. Many of you don't realize that for the first 15 years that I was in this church, I traveled all over the southeastern United States week after week after week after week trying to start churches. I mean, that's old history, but that was my ministry. I mean, I traveled to Georgia, to Atlanta, to Montgomery, to Jackson, Mississippi, to Tuscaloosa, all over the place. I did it every week, trying to get something going with these little Bible studies. Of course, it never gelled because I didn't know what I was doing <laughs> primarily, but anyway. When a group takes responsibility for evangelism and teaching the word, the spirit motivates outreach through evangelism, both personal and the gift. The spirit motivates outreach through ministry to individual believers. Wide open in this church. Believers grow spiritually through what is produced in the worship services they become trained and equipped to minister within the local church and out to edify unbelievers with the gospel and other believers with categorical doctrine, categories of information about life experience. This is the church. It grows numerically through evangelism and by inviting hungry believers to the word. One of the things that this church never did was try to grow numerically just by getting people. We wanted people that were hungry, and therefore we stuck to teaching the Word so that the only thing that was here for people 
There weren't programs. There weren't things to do and hide. Okay, Lord. If you wanted to, if you wanted to learn and grow, this was the place. It still is. Organizations of unbelievers who claim to be a church are not churches at all. Okay, listen to me. Just because something calls itself a church doesn't mean they're a church. If people add works to the gospel, they're not saved. If you're going to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, and be baptized to be saved, you're not saved. Now, I'm not going to fight that. I'm just going to say, and look, do people get saved along the way? Of course they do. There's a man in my life right now, raised in a church, quote, a church, where he quit going, and therefore he thinks that he's going to hell. He told me the other day, he said, I think I'm, because I don't go anymore, I'm going to hell. And I'm like, how can you believe that? How can you live like that? I mean, do you really believe that? How, I mean, I'd be sweating bullets because I believe in hell. In a, oh, sorry. In a, anyway, this is not a church. This is a group of people calling themselves a church, but these people have been deceived. Simple as that, and that's a biblical idea. Any group that adds works to grace are not saved and can't be a church regardless of what they claim to be or what they call themselves. So, that's, those, those people are part of these, this idea of the birth and growth of a church. They've been included. It's a liberal idea. But let's talk about the life cycles of a church. This is the average church, and this is for real churches and not real churches. These are just facts that apply to any kind of organization under the sun including the church. There's a birth. Evangelism, mission churches, mission church plants, Bible studies, these are all the sources of how churches become into being. God inspires and brings together believers to form more than a Bible study, an organization to train, to equip, to prepare ministers to multiply, to reach out, to take responsibility for that. That's a church. A church is more than coming and studying the Bible. It's more than that. So, second stage, once it's birthed, it grows. It grows numerically through evangelism and ministry adding new members, young people, couples with children, etc., training ministries, looking out for pockets of positive believers where you can go and minister to them, bring them in or, or minister out with the Internet. Who knows what you can do these days? Who knows what a church is these days? I'm not sure even how to define that anymore. But there's a growth where you're adding, you're building, you're building, you're building, you're building. But there comes a point when the growth reaches a place of equilibrium where you begin to lose as much as you gain. And there's a plateauing, a plateauing. And it's at this place in a church that if the church doesn't regroup and begin to serve, if service is not the focus, if we, do, if we don't become trained and equipped to serve, to, to serve, listen, to grow to the place where all of your life, all of your possessions, all of your time, all of your everything belongs to God for his use, for his service. 
If you're a 10 percenter, if 10 percent of your life belongs to God and the rest belongs to you, then you're in a place of growth. God, we reach through this plateau place through growth by continuing to grow all the way to the point where your life is nothing but for God. Those people are sold out for God. They minister wherever they go to whoever they're with. They're constantly reaching out. They're constantly touching lives. They're not afraid anymore. I mean, this is where you get to. You're not afraid anymore of invading people's privacy, whatever that is. I mean, how do you invade somebody's privacy that's going to the lake of fire? I mean, invade my privacy, please. Oh. And you're, you're, you're reaching out constantly to everybody that you meet. You're no longer afraid of being thought of as that religious guy. Don't care about that anymore. You reach out. You touch. You talk to the cashier at Walmart. You talk to the lady that cleans your teeth. Or, 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 you know, you try. But anyway, the equilibrium place is plateauing. Numerical growth levels off. The church goes about the business of ministry. Now, the fourth stage is decline. And this can be a long stage. Once growth slows, so does momentum. The church begins to lose more members than it gains, even while everyone continues working. The same people end up in the same positions of responsibility perpetually. Children's ministries die out. Members get old, get sick, and die out. And finally, if that continues, there's, a, there's what's called a death, where eventually the ministry turns back into simply a Bible study, Attendance and giving decrease, ministries die out, and finally the last few people close the doors. This has happened millions of times throughout church history. Millions upon millions. It's just a, and listen, it's a normal life cycle. It's a normal life cycle. When believers are through ministering, serving, reaching out in their life, in a church, then the church begins to diminish. It's just that simple. Just that simple. So, the life cycle, this cycle of church life and death has happened millions of times over the centuries. It's part of God's design. Listen, this is part of God's design that when believers in the local church lose their passion for service, for outreach, for whatever reason, that they lose the growth and momentum required to keep the local church vibrant and alive. It's just a fact. Now, let's talk about what creates life. The health of the Christian church is determined by individual believers, spiritual growth, and fulfillment of the plan of God as revealed in the Word of God. Everything in the Christian life, in fact, everything in life, boils down to the individual, me. Now listen, this lesson is for me. It's about me. It's about my life. It's about my service. It's about my growth. It's about my willingness to Allow God into every corner of my heart to change me. It's about me. And I encourage you to see it in that light for yourself. But lest you think I'm preaching at you, I am preaching at me. I have had so many opportunities to edify that I've just let go by the wayside because it was inconvenient, because I didn't feel good, because my body hurt, whatever. 
I've had so many opportunities in my life that I've just slipped, let them slip by. Walking through the checkout counter at the grocery store. Instead of saying something about the Lord, just let it go. Why would I do that? I know why I do it. I, I do it. I know why I did it. I don't do that much anymore. When I touch people in this life, I'm going to say something. It's time to speak out. It's time for me anyway. It's time for me to stop being afraid of how people are going to think about me. And it's time for me to share with them the things they desperately need that I've been given freely. It's time for me to become a source, an active, giving, loving source. Now, I've fell down on the loving part more times than I can count, but it's depending on us as individuals. First, you got to have people that are positive to the word. People that are willing to listen and learn the truth of God's word and listen. The truth is grace. It's grace. If you don't understand what that means, let me share, let me try to help you. It's, it's God's work in salvation that you simply believe and receive. When you move into it, at the moment you trust in Christ for your salvation, you become saved, 50 things, you move into the Christian life. Everything operates in the Christian life the same way. God has provided everything. The truth, the word, faith, the spirit, everything for you to learn and understand and believe and at the right moment, the Spirit recalls it, and you can believe it to operate in your life in a spiritual way. All of that's provided by the Spirit. All we ever do is decide what we're going to believe. Either you're going to believe the Word in that moment, or you're going to believe something else to deal with your situation. Every moment of your life is like that. One moment after the next. You're determining what you're going to believe because your volition at salvation becomes free to choose for God. Relatively so. You still have the habits that you grew up with that suck you back, but all you got to do is confess sin and you're back over here in the spirit. Just holding on over here is the hard part because the moment you let go, you're back over here operating just like you always did. But that's another topic. You got to be willing to listen and learn. Now, I think we do pretty good at that. We've done pretty good at that over the years. In fact, <laughs> maybe too good. One of the misunderstandings that I've had, that I had early in my life about the Christian life, was that if I simply came to Bible class and listened to the Word, that somehow it would magically fix all of my problems. That's not true. Have you figured that out yet? That's not true. Never was true. It was a good emphasis to learn, because at the time I heard it, there weren't a lot of churches teaching much of anything. Still aren't. So the emphasis on learning was really important for me, but to the idea that just by listening to it and learning it and understanding it, it would fix me, well, didn't work. That led me to come to understand there were some other things involved as far as growth, which had to do with believing and, and operating on some things within me. But, so... Faith perception, you have to attach faith to the truth as revealed by the Spirit in Bible class. Hopefully the Spirit is revealing something to you as we're discussing this. He's showing you something for you that applies to you. And as you see that, if you're open to it, you need to believe it. You need to be open to believe it. 
faith perception. Faith application. Attach faith to the word as the spirit recalls it. Because, see, the spirit empowers you to understand spiritual things. These are things you can't understand just with the human mind. You might be able to logically understand them, but you can't relate to them personally. The Spirit enables you to hear these things and relate personally to what the Bible says in a way that you can use it in your life. And so you have to believe it, to hear it, to, be, to assimilate it. There's a faith going in, and there's a faith when, you, when it's going out. So situations come up. And if you're in the Spirit, if you've not sinned and you've confessed and you're in the Spirit, the Spirit will recall, Jesus said, He will bring to your remembrance that which you need to deal with the moment. So that recall image, light bulb, is what you have to believe in the moment to apply to the situation. That's how you grow. That's how you live. That's how you serve. That's how you win in your life. It's when that breaks down and you stop doing that, you stop walking in the Spirit, you stop trusting the Word, believing it in the situation, in the moment. You stop believing it. That's when everything breaks down and fear takes over. Anger, bitterness takes over. Because you can't make it work. Your life's not working for you. When you believe that your life is a series of circumstances and that happiness in life comes from positive circumstances and that's what you're looking for God to do for you and he doesn't do that and you go, well, what's wrong, God? Why aren't you giving me X, Y, Z? You've misunderstood how all this works. You've misunderstood it. You think it's about stuff when really it's about you and him walking through. And listen, we've been blessed. Oh, my goodness. Can you imagine being born in the Soviet Union in 1942 with war, World War II? Was it 42? 43, Kurt? 42 is when it started. And here you are born into that life. Your father's conscripted into the military. Who knows how your mother survives? What a life to live. But do you think God provides for those people? Absolutely. Do you think God provides a way to the, for those people to be happy? Absolutely he does. Because happiness is not about What's outside of you, it's about what's inside of you. So, transformation. This is where the rub comes. This is the most difficult part of it. The, the confronting yourself, looking at yourself honestly. This is the hardest thing to do. None of us like it. Most of it has to deal with things that hurt us, things that frightened us or, or we thought were terrible or horrible, things that happened as, as we grew up that, that maimed us, that twisted us, that we just covered up instead of facing and dealing with. And people say, well, you know, I had a wonderful childhood. I grew up in a wonderful... Uh, look. I'm glad you did, but it, did, it didn't insulate you from the devil's world. You still grew up in the devil's world. You still misunderstood what life was about. You still believed a lot of goofy stuff about how to live life and make it work. Maybe even you grew up in a religious place where they taught you a lot of false things about how to please God, like my buddy that I was talking about. These are things... See, for you to be fully functional as a believer, 
to live out the life of Christ through you. No longer I who live but Christ. You have to remove these things. You can't just tamp them down and try to live on top of them. It won't work. Something comes in, the right circumstance, and a root of bitterness springs up and defiles your whole life. Can't do it. You got to pull it out. You got to pull out the roots. Throw it away. Talk, had this talk many times. In my opinion, this is where many of us are stuck. I don't think many of us have actually taken that seriously. It's as if it's, 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 if it's optional. As if you've heard it as optional. Of course, it's all optional. It's all optional. But if you're going to keep growing, that's not optional. Let me raise a little hell. It's not optional. Not for me or you either. Facing these things in us that are not from God is not an option. No more than allowing the enemies in the land to stay was an option for the Exodus generation, for the Jews. And that was the things that plagued them and plagued them and plagued them was those enemies they did not destroy when God said, kill them all. It's the same for you and I. That stuff that we allow, we negotiate with it. We negotiate a peace treaty with our sins, with our lust, with our bitterness, with our blocked out pain. We negotiate. We think somehow I'll just live over here and pretend it's not there. Or I'll just keep confessing it. There's no victory in that. If that's where you are in your life, then you've got to go to the next place by turning and facing it and dealing with it. There's no victory in negotiating with this stuff and letting it lay. So, I'll quit fussing. Rejecting and removing human programming based on your trend. Listen, whatever your trend is, is the way you've programmed yourself. If you're lascivious, then you've programmed yourself with pleasure. You've got all kind of pleasure systems that you've left in your life. If you're ascetic, then you've got all kind of uh, uh, self-righteous discipline structures that you're so proud of and you're so grateful that you're better than others. All of us lascivious people. That's religion. Religion says, oh, I'm so disciplined and I can live this certain way and I'm better than you lascivious people over there in the bar. And you get pleasure and joy out of your discipline. It's a lust. See, the Bible makes no distinction between lust for asceticism and lust for sinful pleasure. It makes no distinction. It says it's all rooted in desire. It's your normal desire that should attach to God being attached to wrong things in life, be they ascetic be they lascivious, either way. All of it, listen, all of it needs to go. Just because you'll never get all of it gone, you say, well, I'll never get all, doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Am I wrong? Tell me, am I wrong? Am I meddling? Am I meddling in your life? I don't care. Forming new man belief systems through assimilation of doctrine and replacing embracing the motives and thinking of Christ, this is how you go from living and dealing with that those things outside of you. You see, in, as you grow spiritually, you come out of being a baby. You develop the spiritual skills of walking in the spirit of of the faith cycle, of faith rest, and you learn to deal with the circumstances as they come. And once you begin to master that, it's time, and you, listen, this is the armor. You've put on the armor, you've learned to use it, you've practiced your swordsmanship, you've learned how to use your shield, all that. The Lord says, time to turn and deal with a person in the armor. Time to deal with character. Belief systems. 
Time to do that. So, all of this working together inspires service. Your gift begins to function. You have a desire to edify. You have a desire to help. You see someone suffering and you just want to help them. You see somebody in need and you want to give them money. You see somebody needing the answer and you want to explain. Whatever your gift is, see, there's growth, which is where you do anything. You just do what's needed. You do what's needed. And when your church gets small, you do, everybody does what's needed. People that don't have the gift of giving give money. You know, they teach Sunday school. They do the things that need to be done. And what they don't do is say, you know, I've done my duty. I'm old and tired. I'm not doing anymore. They don't do that. They don't do that. So, service, growth, meeting the needs of fellow believers, gifts, specific area of ministry. A, and listen, a breakdown in any of these areas results in reversionism. If you stop listening, you're in reversionism. If you stop applying to the things outside of you, you've given up. You're in reversionism. If you stop dealing with your own self, you shut down growth. If you stop growing, you're done. You got to grow all the way to the end. Listen. Listen. You want to be going so fast that when you hit heaven, you leave skid marks on the throne room floor. Okay? That's how fast you want to be rolling. You have to put on the brakes. That's just an image. You know, the Lord has taught me through the eyes of my heart to create all these images of the Christian life by which I, that I embrace, that I, that, that drive me, that steer me, that guide me, that help me, that, that ward off discouragement. And that's one of my images I share with you. Anything, any place that we break down, learning the whole realm of doctrine, the faith rest cycle, removing false beliefs, replacing them with the mind of Christ, forming his character, devoted to service, surrendering yourself to God, any area that you break down, that you stop, you start going backwards. You start diminishing. And listen, this is when service quits. This is when ministry quits. This is when sharing your faith quits. Is when you quit growing. When you start losing momentum. When individual believers and groups of believers stop growing unto maturity, leading to a total surrender to the Lord, the church begins to stall out and decline. When we quit, the church quits. The church either makes changes to resume momentum or enters into a death spiral. Like I say, this has been proven millions of times. Millions of times. It's not, I didn't make it up. This is just facts. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and break here and uh, take, uh, take an offering. And uh, we'll have a short break. And I don't guess we have music today. I mean, we'll have uh, Richard. You got some music for us, Richard? You going to... You gonna... You you gonna sing a, a solo? All right, let's let's pray. Heavenly Father, these are hard things to discuss. This is my family. This is my home. This is where I've grown up. It's where I've lived my Christian life. These are my brothers and sisters. This is these are things that we've got to face. In my opinion, they're just realities that 
that we have to look at and be honest about so that we know where we are in your plan. And we know that all the grace that you've got is still available to us. We're, we're, it's still there. And that you're willing to use us. You're willing to use us. And so we pray for that, Father. I want to be used. I want to be used in a way that, I, in a greater way than ever before. I want to be able to surrender myself to you in a greater way than I ever have. I want to stop holding back and stop keeping my life for myself, for my sins, for my ascetic discipline, for my hungers. And I want to attach my hunger to you in the spirit, in the word, in the service of Christ. I want to be that person, Father, that stands before you at the judgment seat and is worthy, is proud because of what God did through me. I want to be that. I really do, Father. So I know that, I know that we do, all of us do. I know that. I know these people, and I love these people, and I'm proud of these people, Father, and I pray that you give us the courage and the energy and the motivation and the, and the wisdom to proceed from here and ask it in Christ's name, amen. Years ago when we began our school, School of Biblical Theology, we had some guidelines for giving a sermon. And of course we did our Greek and Hebrew and our history, our academic preparation. But at the end of all that, we had to ask a question. And the question was, so what? So what? I mean, what does that mean for the average person? You can do all this academic, gather all this academic information together, but if you don't put it in terms that are that is relatable to the average person, then, then it doesn't really help a lot. So this is one of those so what's. I mean, who cares about the life cycle of the church? Well, I think I do. Because I think it applies to us. So we're talking about how the individual believer affects the group and how groups are made up just of individual, individual together. And that when any, any one of us stalls out in our spiritual growth, in our momentum, we stall out because we fail to take on the next challenge. The challenge is outward and the challenge is inward. We, listen, and we don't fail, we refuse. We choose to say no to God. Can't get any simpler than that. God says, I want you to take this next challenge. I want you to look at this thing that you put in your heart sometime back that you've been using to interpret your life and deal with your life, this way of thinking about things. That didn't come from me. You created that yourself, or you borrowed it from uh, uh, somebody in your life, or you got it from the world, and you adopted it as a way of thinking for yourself. And I want you to remove that because it does not serve, it, it, you may feel like it serves your interest and maybe it protects you, but it doesn't serve God's interest and he wants it gone. And some of these things are very difficult to deal with. Some of them are, I mean, as quote a psychologist, as a counselor, I'm really none of those things, I'm a preacher. I'm a teacher, but I ended up, ended up with a niche with helping people individually a lot. I've heard all kinds of stories. Rhonda and I have heard so many stories you wouldn't believe. 
just people have been hurt, people have been abused, people just terrible things have happened to people. The world, the devil's world is a harsh and cruel place. And it, and it listen, it, it is no respecter of persons. And so when people have been hurt terribly in their life, they, they, when they're young, especially without spiritual resources, they can't deal with that. And so they take that pain and they hide it away and cover it up and build defenses between them and that pain. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. And those things work for a while in a person's soul. It enables you to live again and push on with your life rather than being destroyed. But listen, that part of your heart now belongs to the devil because he's, he's been able to use the pain of sin and evil to shut down that part of you. You've compartmentalized yourself. And the Lord wants to heal you from that. The Lord wants to open that back up in your life, revisit that whole event, and, and show you the grace solution to let you heal that part of your heart so it can be healthy and, and, and channel his love again. When it's all scarred up and shut down, his love can't go through it. If you're a shut down person, if you've shut down your heart, your feelings, Colossians 3.21, the love of God cannot flow through you. It can flow into you, but it can't flow through you because you can't open your heart and let him out through you. Simple as that. I don't know how to illustrate it any differently. And these are the things that are most difficult for us to face and, and change and deal with. And many of us in this church are at that place because we've come through the learning. There's, there's not much that we don't know about the Word of God. Forty-something years of intense discussion has educated us. We've all faced many circumstances in our life, and I'm talking to the old heads here, but I don't know how much of our ourself we've looked at and confronted and, and, and changed. And this is what makes the difference between the average believer and the absolute winner, the winner, the one that takes it all the way, scores the touchdown, wins the game. So I don't want to be at the end of my life realizing that I've left things undone that God wanted me to do that I just said, can't do it. Hurts too much, too afraid, too hard, not going to do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here and go through the motions. Now, not, I don't know who you are. I don't know who you plan to be. I don't know what your life is going to be like. I don't know what you want. I do know this. I do know that God has provided the means for us to give all of ourselves to him, little at a time can't just do that. People talk about, preachers tell you what to do, what you're supposed to do, but they don't tell you how to do it. And they don't tell you that it's a slow process over time, little by little by little by little by little. Little by little. Listen, change happens in a moment, but you build up to it a little bit at a time to where you're like ready and it happens. Boom. And you get a little rest in the plan of God. You get a little plateau time. 
Guess what? Time to go again. You climb in the hill, and look, some of us have quit climbing the hills, and we're, we're reaching for spikes, trying to climb Mount Everest in the plan of God, facing things that are just harder than anything we've ever faced. And the deal is, you got to keep going. You got to keep going. You can't just, well, I've done, I've done well. I've done well. How many people has Gary ministered to? So he he gets to he gets to retire now. I don't think so. <laughs> Ask him if he's going to retire. No. How do you do that as a Christian? You've done enough. I've done enough. I've given enough money. I've served on enough committees. I've done enough ministry. I've used my gift. No such thing. Listen, like I say, you keep rolling. So, the church at Corinth is a great example of a struggling church. I just want to give you some highlights. This church had great potential, abundant potential, but they had overwhelming problems. They had a cultural issue. The culture they were in was is bad or worse than ours. But they managed to stay alive, at least we believe until about 100 AD, about 45 years out from their birth, 45, 50 years, we think they're still alive. Because Clement... Uh, would, if you turn to Philippians 4 3, just real quick. Uh, Chris told me that he had, you know, you saw Chris playing with the lights up here. He said he had to turn the lights down because my head kept shining too bright. <laughs> now that's fun. <laughs> no, I'm too bright. No, I'm fine now, yeah. All right, Philippians 4 3. Oh, let's see. I had two. D, I don't, my Bible doesn't have a three. Uh, let's see. All right, he says, talking about Euodia and Syntyche, uh, Cynthia uh, to live in harmony. I asked to help these women who shared my struggle and the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of the fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Now Clement was a fellow worker with Paul and he wrote a letter to the Corinthian church we believe about 100 AD. Now that... The 1st and 2nd Corinthians, where we get all this information, was written in about 55 A.D. So the church had been in existence about five years, so 50 to 100 is about 50 years. We know the church made it. Now listen to all the stuff that was going on, and they made it at least 50 years. They, uh, the church at Corinth was a mess of carnality, both lascivious and self-righteous sinfulness. You see, life under the sin nature creates behavior motivated by either lascivious or, las or ascetic trends, as we said earlier. Under lascivious, they had incest in the church, chapter 5. They had prostitution in the church. Drunkenness and gluttony, that was the issue with the Eucharist, they would they would have the love feast. Afterwards, it was supposed to be a, you know, they would eat together and have a celebration where they would pass the cup and the bread. And the rich people who paid for it all would go in and, and get drunk and eat all the food so that the poor people who came for the Eucharist, there wouldn't be anything left. And that was the type of stuff that was happening. Idolatry, the temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love, was in Corinth. And the temple, in order to worship at the temple of Aphrodite, 
you would go there and have sex with a prostitute. There were said to have over a thousand male and female prostitutes at this temple. That's a big temple. It's a big religious complex or big religious system that permeated the whole city. And it really, really brought a, a corrupting influence to all the people. And many of these people were accustomed to being promiscuous in my life and in their life and, and participating in all this kind of stuff. And uh, anyway, there was a lot of promiscuity going on in the church. And I've got chapter 81, verse 11, or it's actually 8, 1 through 11. But Then you had ascetics, you had the self-righteous types that were creating divisions. Chapter 1, 10 through 11, in chapter 11, uh, verse 1. I don't know what happened there, but uh, you had a preference of teachers. This was Paul's first complaint with these guys. I mean, he says, you're into carnality. One says, I'm, I, I, I study under Paul, one under Peter, one under Apollos. And he says, who are these people other than people God used? You got to listen to God. It doesn't matter who the teacher is. Lawsuits, they were taking each other to court over minor things. I don't think it's always wrong to go to court. There are times, but especially in the early part of the church, these people were in an intense phase of developing the church. And Paul said, there should be no lawsuits. You take the stuff to the, you take it to the leadership of the church and let them resolve it. That would be well if we could do that. Chapter 8, you've got believers judging other believers because of meat sacrificed to idols. And he has this whole discussion about the fact that an idol is nothing. He also does this in, in Romans chapters 13, 14, 15, the same idea that meat sacrificed to an idol, look, the temple of Aphrodite, they would sacrifice a cow to Aphrodite. Then they would take the fresh meat and sell it out the back door. There was, there was the only source of fresh meat. And people would buy it and, and eat it. And they were feeling like they were sinning because they were eating meat sacrificed to idols. Paul said, there's no such thing as an idol, but if you believe that you're sinning by eating that meat, then don't eat it. So there's a whole discussion about the law of love and all of that business. And we've, many of us have, have studied that. So here's my point. If any church had a reason to fail, it was this church. So many sin problems. Paul's second letter indicates that his instructions to correct some of these issues had been effective. The Corinthian letter written... Letters were written in 55 A.D., and the letter from Clement, probably 100 A.D., indicate this church was still alive 45 years later. Some give a date even as late as 145 A.D., so it could have been a lot longer. Point being, this church transcended generations. It transcended leaders. It was able to transcend from one leader. Paul's the one that gets this thing rolling and it transcends to another leader and then to another leader, leaders, so that it's able to survive and thrive for multi-generations and spin off other churches out of it. That is what you're after. So, reasons why a church will die. Point five, entropy. All of you who understand entropy is just a natural phenomena in nature. All organized systems naturally fall apart and die. The best example is a campfire. If you don't keep giving it wood, it burns out and dies. You got to keep giving it fuel. When we stop adding fuel to the fire through evangelism and outreach, we lose momentum and we die out no matter how special your ministry was in the past. 
You know what makes this ministry special? Is grace. You're not going to, you're not going to, and it's a sad fact, and it is a fact. Listen, if there was somebody else out there teaching grace, I would know about it. I don't meet anybody that understands grace. I don't meet anybody. I talk to all kinds of people from all over, and people don't understand grace, either for salvation and especially for living the Christian life. I grew up in the Baptist church where we got saved by grace, but then we lived by works. Actually, we lived by social life, which was a work. We showed up for Wednesday night supper, and that made you spiritual. Those of you who grew up in the Baptist church know what I'm talking about. You just showed up. You didn't know what to do, but just show up. But you came to RAs, and you did your thing, and you know, you showed up. By showing up, you were participating in the church program. That was being spiritual. Nobody knew any better than that. Well, now we know better. Being spiritual means to be filled with the Spirit and walk in the Spirit. When the tests come, we use the Word of God that we know. We put our faith in it and use it to win the day over our circumstances. We then take the Word of God and turn it on ourselves and purify our own hearts through a great, long, terrible, difficult process, but we do it so that we can be free from our trends and free to, to assemble the Christian life within us, the mind of Christ, we do all these things. This is what we do. This is how we win. And that's what makes this church unique and worth carrying on. It's what makes it carrying on. You're not going to, I don't know where else you're going to get this. There's places on the Internet there's teachers that have taught this that have recorded it. This is one of the places. But I don't know where else you could go and learn how to live the Christian life by grace. Do you know another place? Speak up. I mean, if, if, if this ends today, where are we going to go to get grace? Where are we going to go to hear about it? Where are we going to go to learn about it? Where are we going? We got to, listen, we got to carry on. Yeah. I can't, I can't go to Connecticut. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, will you? So, the believers stop growing in their personal life. We lose interest in the message. We become distracted by the message. We get distracted by some great thinker, some great speaker, but an unbeliever. You know, Victor David ha Davis Hansen is a great thinker. I love to listen to him. Jordan Peterson is a great thinker and speaker. I love to listen to these guys, but they're not saved. Not that I know of. They may, Victor may be. I think he probably is. Jordan Peterson's not that I know of. These are great thinkers. They're great establishment thinkers, historians, psychologists. But they, you, who cares? I can't teach you about the grace of God. People get distracted by this stuff, though. They get distracted by social life, by work, other legitimate reasons, family, children, causes you to not hear a biblical message on a regular basis. People get distracted. All kinds of things. You can use service. You can use Christian ministry to distract you away from your own momentum, believe it or not. And you can, listen, you can, you can stop listening and you can stop living. You refuse to make application. You stop, you stop using the faith cycle. With your adversities, you stop re removing old man beliefs. You stop confronting yourself. You stop putting together the new man in your life and living it out. And finally, what is the solution? Well, the simplicity of it is to resume growing. 
wherever, if you've broken down and you've stopped growing, or maybe you never have grown, really. Maybe you've faithfully set through because of whatever reason. Maybe you've never really, really heard this or applied some of this. It's time. Give it a shot. Just give it a shot in your life. Listen to it and try to, try to believe it and use it. And I promise you this, God will show up in your life. He will show up and show himself to you in a real way. And you'll be like, wow, whoa, blow you away. And you'll go, well, that's what they've been talking about all this time. <laughs> you got to resume growing and focus on the service of outreach. The reason we've talked about moving is to put ourselves in a place. You know, th this church has never really drawn its members from out of a community. For many years, we drew people out of taper groups and different things like that. People, people that had been involved in Bob Thiem's ministry and people moved to the community and became a community church in that way. But, but what, what fed this, the numbers of people in this church before is gone. That's gone. The whole doctrinal thing's gone. Isn't that right, Gary? Pretty much gone. I don't know much of it, any, anywhere it's anyway. So we've talked. We've talked about moving. I think it's a good idea. It's what I want to do. But it's. But listen, it's all of us. It's all of us. You know, we can sit here and die, or we can go somewhere else where we got a chance. Even if we die, at least we'll die fighting. I'm going to die fighting. That's just my opinion. And, then, you know, look, I'm just being honest with you. I'm just speaking from the heart. I'm just trying to share with you as a brother and somebody who's tried to be a leader here what I think that the facts are and what the truth is and what I believe. If, that, if that's helpful to you, I'm glad. If not then you, you and the Lord work it out. That's it for me. Let's go, let's close with prayer. And, uh, and Rick, you'll lead us out however you choose. Father, these things, like I say, they're not easy to discuss. This wasn't easy for me to talk about today. This has been my home for almost 40 years. Most of my adult life. And so the idea of us not having a church is not a good thought for me, and I'm, I'm not going to let that happen easily if I have something to say about it. And so I'm in, in encouraging our people to pray, to ask, to seek wisdom, to be willing to do what's necessary to pass on this grace message to another generation of leaders ministers, administrators, deacons, elders, that we might carry on the grace message to a whole new group, to a whole nother generation who may carry this nation to a whole new height of greatness. We don't know. I don't know. I just, I just hope that you let us be part of what you're doing in a big way, and I ask it in Christ's name. Amen.